Nowadays, Canadians regularly say that one of the things they like best about their country is its universal medical care. But Medicare was not inevitable. In fact, it almost didn't get started at all. Then in 1944, Saskatchewan elects the first socialist government in North America. The party is the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF. The new premier is T.C. Douglas, known to most as just Tommy. As premier, Douglas takes the health portfolio himself and goes to work. They say to you, you need a surgeon or you need a specialist, and you will choose the surgeon, and you will choose the specialist. A confident Douglas announces his Medicare plan and calls an election on it. The government proposes to introduce a province-wide prepaid medical care program that will supply uh, medical services to every citizen in the province. The doctors of the province fear the plan will curb their economic freedom and kill their own private insurance plans. But Douglas and the men of the CCF are not concerned with the doctors' fears. The election of 1960 is fought over one issue, Medicare. Ross Thatcher, Liberal Party leader, is Douglas's main opponent. Most of the doctors get behind Thatcher, who it is said campaigns like a charging bull. But if Thatcher is a bull, Douglas is a matador. The doctors call the CCF communists and say the plan could create a future where doctors are like slaves. Menopausal women can be sent to mental institutions and Catholic hospitals must perform abortions. June 8th, the CCF wins the election handily with 40% of the vote and 38 of 54 seats. Douglas appoints a commission to design the plan. Impatient with its squabbling, he uses an interim report to draft the legislation. It is quickly passed in November 1961 and set to go into effect the following year. They came to power with a, a vast majority and then they started throwing their weight around as though they were uh, complete communists. Thinking his lifelong goal of universal medical care has been achieved in Saskatchewan, Douglas resigns as Premier in order to lead the newly formed and national New Democratic Party. But back home there is a political storm growing, and the man whom Douglas has left behind to face it is the new Premier Woodrow S. Lloyd. Doctors now threaten that if the government goes ahead, they will leave the province en masse. April. The doctors make a counter-proposal. Instead of Medicare, their private insurance schemes would remain. For those who can prove they're too poor to afford the premiums, the province could provide subsidies. Premier Lloyd rejects the proposal, and doctors begin to leave the province, many for the United States. Those who remain are talking strike. May 3rd, doctors attend an emotionally charged rally in Regina. Premier Lloyd walks into the lion's den to appeal to the doctors directly. It does not go well. The moment Lloyd sits down, someone calls for a vote. The doctors overwhelmingly support a strike. A left-wing tactic against a left-wing government. The walkout is set for the day the act becomes law, July 1st. Some people get angry with the doctors. Others blame Premier Lloyd and Douglas. The doctors have a problem. If the strike is to work, they have to withhold treatment. But they feel they can't let patients die. Premier Lloyd makes a last-ditch attempt to head off the strike. He says that the doctors can opt out of the act. But they're confident they can force him to cancel it completely. The strike will go forward. At one minute past midnight on July 1st, 1962, Medicare becomes law. The doctors go on strike, and Saskatchewan's health care system shuts down. The government advertises internationally for replacement doctors. Lloyd has no trouble attracting doctors. Over a hundred arrive, most of them from Britain. But the foreign doctors can't replace all the strikers, and their arrival doesn't calm the fear of frustration. I have a family of five little girls. One girl is suffering from cerebral palsy. We have a specialist in Saskatoon, which is second to none in the North American continent. Now you tell me, sir, when this specialist leaves, which he, he no doubt will leave because he has no alternative, 
Where will I take my daughter? To Montreal? Will the government pay me transportation? Where will I go? Tell but, me. But, sir, this is not the issue. This is the issue. This is my issue. This is the people's issue. Groups called Keep Our Doctors Committees spring up all over the province to support the strike. One KOD is started by some Regina mothers over coffee. You know, the thing that worries me about this, I'm beginning to feel like a cornered rat. The people have requested a delay in this plan, and uh, we've done everything we possibly can do. We can't do any more, and our doctors are leaving. Whether spontaneous or orchestrated, the KOD's campaign soon gathers momentum. One of the targets of the protests is the foreign doctors. The first time I have ever been frightened or realized the power of, of some oratory. I'm sure if I had suggested, after listening to some of the other speakers, if I had suggested that people go out and get their guns and, and uh, deal with the legislation in that fashion, they'd have done it. It frightened me. Vigilante groups now threaten violence on both sides. I got a letter one day telling me I was going to, kill, going to be killed if we didn't cancel this, and so did Woodrow. So I took the 10 gauge, I put three shells in there at night time when I went to bed. But the doctors and the KODs have planned a giant rally outside the legislature in Regina. Premier Lloyd knows that if the doctors can muster a massive show of public support, the strike might succeed and the first Medicare plan in Canada will be finished before it gets started. July the 11th. Thousands of angry people converge on the capital. Today, the doctors and their allies must force the government to give in or lose the strike. Afraid of trouble, both the CCF and the police have men in plain clothes among the crowd. We are here to say that this is a bad law. The government lies low, waiting to see if the rally gathers steam. Trying to force a confrontation, Ross Thatcher marches into the building. The chamber is locked, so he has his picture taken trying to kick down the door. He thunders that Saskatchewan is turning into Cuba or Russia. But despite its enthusiasm, the crowd is smaller than the doctors hoped. The rally leaders hand a petition to Health Minister Davies and go home. Premier Lloyd and his colleagues realize the momentum has shifted in their favor. Lloyd decides it's time to bring in a fixer to end the strike. The man he chooses is Lord Stephen Taylor from London. Thatcher dubs him Lord Haw Haw, but the eccentric Labour peer is not only a physician. He's also one of the architects of Britain's National Health Service. The doctors fear that if they don't go back, they will lose their patients to the British replacement doctors or to a new form of socialized medicine. Support for Medicare becomes more vocal. July 18th. In a brave move, the doctors show up at a CCF convention. We have seen an attempt to intimidate and to blackmail the government and the people of this province into repealing and rescinding legislation which the great majority of the people have voted for. After listening to Douglas denounce them, the doctors send their spokesman to the podium. The Council of the College has authorized me to put forward a new proposal, which, in essence, involves prop, prompt amendment of the Act and the simultaneous action of the College in urging members to return to private practice. For five days, Lord Taylor, whose specialty is psychiatry, shuttles between the two sides. Then, on the last morning, as he is in his bath at the Besborough Hotel, word comes to Lord Taylor that the doctors will sign the agreement. July 23rd, the strike is over, the doctors go back to work. The acceptance of universal publicly funded health insurance for all of the province's 900,000 people. By 1970, following Saskatchewan's lead, all the provinces in Canada have brought in comprehensive Medicare programs. And the second is, again it's been mentioned, to save Medicare 
from subtle strangulation. Our friends in the United States are spending 9% of their gross national product. And they get a higher per capita gross national product than we do. They spend 9% of their gross national product on health care and 34 million of their people have no health care coverage. And in Canada, we spend 7% of our gross national product and every man, woman and child in Canada is covered under Medicare. But I want to warn you, as one who started out even before I was in politics, dedicated to the idea of comprehensive health insurance, fought for it through all my political life. I want to say to you that Medicare and hospital insurance are already marked for destruction unless you stop the per capita taxes and the extra billing which most of the governments of Canada are, are now permitting. It means that increasingly the people who can afford to pay the per capita tax and the people who can afford to pay extra billing will pay it. And they will get the best care. They will get the most experienced surgeons and physicians. They will get into the best hospitals. And the people who can't pay, they'll take what's left. If you want a two-tiered health program, then just continue the way we're going. And I remind you that in this movement we pledged ourselves 50 years ago that we would provide health care for every man, woman, and child irrespective of their color, their race, or their financial status. And by God, we're going to do it!